Cominarian Augustifolium. Fireweed is in the Onagrachae family, along with other plants such as the evening primrose, and it is a widespread pioneer plant that frequently is among the first things to regrow after a wildfire. In fact, its very name, fireweed, derives from that fact. And during World War II, fireweed was briefly known as bombweed because it was often among the first plants to pioneer new growth in bomb craters. And at one time or another, in one way or another, nearly every part of this ubiquitous plant is useful. And that's awesome, because fireweed is not terribly hard to identify, though one does need to know the basic identification traits because there are several fairly toxic lilies that resemble it, especially early on during their growth. For starters, just recognize that the fireweed is a tall, elegant, and graceful plant that typically averages between 1.5 and 3 meters in height, though generally, when I find it, it's right around 1.75 meters. And when it's in bloom, it's typically easy to spot, if not here, because it will be heavily visited by bees, wasps, butterflies, moths, and other pollinating insects that rely on its nectar. Fireweed has a round stalk that feels as though it has tiny, short hairs all up and down it. And if you sever the stalk, you will discover that it is solid. There is an inner pith, an inner green ring, a narrow band, and then an outer green ring. The leaves spiral up the stem, and they are fairly distinct and easily identified. At the top of the plant they are small, and may lengthen to become as much as 8 inches long near the base. They are pointed and lanceolate, and have a bright off-white vein running up the middle. And if you look very closely at the leaves, you'll notice a particularly important trait for identification. The veins do not run all the way out to the edge of the leaf. Rather, they curve back in, in a growth pattern called anastomosis. While not entirely unique, this is an important identification trait for plants with a fireweed morphology. The leaf veins are quite substantial, and their outline can easily be seen on the back as well as the front side of the leaf. Note also that the underside of the leaf is considerably paler than the top side. In fact, on the underside, it is off-white in the spaces between the veins. And in this cantilever perspective, we can see just how substantial those veins are. The central vein is as if it's a separate growth unto itself, and the primary branching veins can be felt with a touch of a finger, and are in fact substantial enough to create shadows. The leaves spiral up the stems. At the top of the plant is a raceme, or flower cluster, from which the flowers work their way up. Beneath the blossoms are colorful, tubular seed pods, each of which can contain 300 to 400 seeds. And above the flowers waiting for insect fertilization are unopened blossoms like narrow capsules all the way to the very top of the stem, smallest near the top and getting larger as they work their way down till at last they open to become full-fledged flowers. The flowers themselves are red to pink, usually somewhere in between. And in the far north, I have seen rare white variants. The flowers are 2-3 to three centimeters in diameter, and they grow at the end of an equally long tube that starts off very narrow and widens just before the flower opens. It has four slender, graceful petals and four delicate sepals, each at roughly 45 degrees to each other, the sepals being very thin. And following along with the tube format, up the center is a pale, long stigma that opens in four ways like a cloven trumpet, and it is surrounded by almost randomly placed stamens that end in yellow-brown anthers. Usually, when you find fireweed, it'll be growing in thickets that may be small or cover vast areas. Because fireweed can produce up to 80,000 seeds per plant, and on top of that, its spreading root system also clones the plant. Fireweed particularly enjoys the calcareous or calcium-rich soil of burned-out areas. And while it is abundant at first, it has very little tolerance for shade, so as soon as the forest returns, it quickly fades away. Though its seeds can last many, many years in the soil, and if another forest fire should revisit the growing forest, they are ready to spring up anew. Young fireweed leaves and shoots can be eaten, and I have read that the roots are also good, though personally I have never tried it. In the Alaskan wilderness, where I spent many years, fireweed jams, jellies, and syrups are popular among the bush folk, and I like them all, but my particular favorite is fireweed tea. If you've never tried it, I suggest you do. You won't be disappointed, Fireweed tea has a taste resembling black tea, but naturally floral. And of course, it has the added benefit of no caffeine. Or maybe you would like to have that caffeine, in which case it mixes well with ordinary black tea. In fact, I find a 50-50 blend of black and fireweed tea to be a personal favorite. And while you can technically make tea with the fresh green leaves right off the plant, fermenting them greatly enhances the flavor. It's easy to harvest and not too difficult, though somewhat tedious, to ferment. Let's take a look at the process. 
In my experience, it takes one to two dozen fireweed plants to make a single liter jar of fireweed tea. It's not all that much. It's quick and easy to harvest that. Cut mature plants, wrap the lower stem with your hand, and zip it right up the stem, removing the leaves as you go. You want the older, tougher, and more ragged looking leaves from the base, as the tender leaves up top don't have enough flavor and character. Take the leaves home, put them in a shaded place, and set them out to wilt for six hours to a day, depending on how dry and hot it is. A tedious but important part is to check the underside of leaves for insect eggs, otherwise you might get a protein surprise. Six hours to a day later, when the leaves are wilted, comes the next step. Grab a small bunch of the leaves, fold them up, and crush them between the palms of your two hands just by rolling them back and forth firmly to their dark green and thoroughly bruised. Then separate the leaves and toss them into a clean box or onto some paper until you're ready for the next step. When all your leaves are ready, transfer them into a jar. Some persons say to use plastic containers, but I'm very leery of that personally. When I was living in the Alaskan bush, there were a number of fatalities from fermenting in plastic, and so I've just never liked that option. Just pack the leaves into a jar and keep packing them until they are a firm mass. The mass should be able to spring back a little bit, just enough to let water between the spaces. Then fill the jar with water all the way to the top. Then put your fingers over the top of the jar and dump the water back out. Just let it work out until most of the water is gone, leaving the leaves entirely damp. This can take a moment as you want to give the water plenty of time to drip out. Too much water will inhibit fermentation. Too little water will leave things too dry. So you want to get it to the point where the leaves are entirely moist. We just let about every little drop drip out until it seems no more will come unless we were to really shake that jar hard. Now place the jar in a sunny area, put a lid on it to finger tight and only finger tight and let it sit in the sun for three to four days until the leaves lose their color and turn a dark greenish brown. It is very important at this point that the jar stays warm because if it's cool, it'll encourage the growth of mold and ruin the fermentation. 26 to 38 Celsius should be ideal. After three to four days, when the leaves look right, open the jar and remove the leaves. The scent is heavenly. Place the leaves on a cutting board and cut and tear them to small chunks. This will both help them to dry and later when you make tea, it will help them to release their flavors. Next, dry the leaves. If it's hot and dry, you can do this outdoors on a screen. But if it's cool or you're in a rush as we are at this time of the year when we're bringing in a great deal of wild harvest and harvest from the gardens, you can use a dehydrator. And that's it. When the tea is dry, in a few hours, put it in a jar and use it when you're ready. On its own, this tea is lovely, having a floral black tea flavor, and it combines with various other flavors very well. I like to blend it with rose petal leaves and bits of sweet dried fruits. Go ahead, give it a try. I think you'll agree, there really is nothing better than a fine cup of fireweed tea. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of all matter of topics relating to natural science, from ecology and conservation to the nature of the universe beyond our Earth, and making that information practical with solid advice on living well with the natural world. If you appreciate the program, please take a moment to subscribe. Subscribing costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.